Welcome to the first episode of our Nature as Medicine series, in which we explore and reflect on the healing aspects of nature. My name is Sylwia Kieszkowska. I'm a psychologist, psychotherapist, and the creator of the Naturally Balanced platform. Today, I have the pleasure to talk to Nevin Harper, who's a professor at the University of Victoria, Canada, where he teaches youth work and counseling skills, including the use of outdoor and experiential approaches. He has a lot of experience working as an outdoor skills instructor, wilderness guide, youth worker, and registered clinical counselor. Nevin co-authored Nature-Based Therapy, and co-edited Outdoor Therapies. Two really good books, defining the confluence between nature connection, health promotion, and a range of practice opportunities. Nevin was one of my mentors in my forest bathing course. I found his lectures very inspiring. He agreed to share his knowledge and experience with our community. So let's begin. Hello, Nevin. Thank you again so much for for agreeing to meet and finding time. Uh, happy to help, Sylvia. Uh, so I wanted to talk to you about um, ecotherapy as your, your I've, I've read your books that you've co-published about nature-based approach. Mm -hmm. um, and also they were really inspiring to me. And uh, what I understood, they're also designated towards people who, who are looking for inspiration and ways to incorporate nature into clinical practice. And um, to start with, I wanted to ask you, what is the difference? How do you understand the difference between adventure therapy, ecotherapy, nature-based? Mm -hmm. uh, connection activities. Is there a general difference? Which one of those do you practice? Do you intertwine them? Yeah, yeah, good, good place to start, Sylvia, because definitions really help sort of set the stage for the conversation, I mm -hmm. think. And definitions have been a constant source of uh, strife, for some, like disagreement for some, um, entertainment for some. Um, but I, I, what I'll do is I'll share with you what <clears throat> what I think some of those mm -hmm. words mean and how I interpret them and then how I practice with them. Right. And this then is I what also, I'm, yeah, this is what I'm primarily interested in. Yeah. Your understanding. And I can that. also then relate it to how maybe some others see those words being used. And so mm -hmm. um, for me, primarily, some of the key words are um, uh, nature-based, of course. And for us, when we wrote the book Nature-Based Therapy, we weren't we weren't planning on designating a new type of therapy. We just simply wanted to locate mm -hmm. therapeutic practice. And so that book was really an invitation to anyone, whether they work in a school, a hospital, a treatment center, outpatient, occupational therapy, counseling, psychology, social work educational assistance, um, we're working with a diverse range of populations and, di and abilities, but to take whatever your practice is now, your professional training, your qualifications, your, um, your ethical man, your mandates, your ethical frameworks in that, and say, can you transplant that into a place-based outdoor connected with nature and active um, practice? So yeah. mm -hmm. that would say nature-based could simply be me seeing a client here in my office or me seeing my client out under a cedar tree next to my office. Right, so it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, just, it's about location. Mm -hmm. An extension of nature-based is what you've used is ecotherapy. And ecotherapy has an actual, like a, a small body of literature built around it. And it's driven by the philosophy of eco-psychology which is the relationship between the health of the planet and the environment and the health of humans and how those two cannot be divided. And mm -hmm. there's obviously a relationship there. And more mm -hmm. currently we're seeing terms like eco grief, eco anxiety. Mm -hmm. Those are clearly defined by eco psychology. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really about human environmental relationship, which nature-based therapy can be. 
but again, nature based was really about location. Uh, another term that you brought up was adventure therapy. And of course, as soon as you add the term adventure, there's some level of activity that has an inherent element of risk. Risk can be physical, emotional, social, cognitive risks, but ultimately, um, it's doing things kinesthetically, actively that are engaging the human, the person in the activity, in the environment, without really knowing what the outcomes are. Mm -hmm. That's what makes it adventurous. Mm -hmm. And if there are activities that involve some level of risk, whether it's a an activity, say, let's use the example of a trust fall, where someone just basically leans back into someone else's arms, there's an element of, am I going to be caught? I don't know, which elicits some type of affective response, which means there's risk, mm -hmm. right? That means adventure. Mm -hmm. Adventure, you know, has that sort of connotation. And so my version of nature-based therapy in my private practice probably doesn't involve a lot of risk. It doesn't involve, quote unquote, adventure. So I'm not doing adventure therapy then. But if I work with another organization or places I've worked in the past where we're running expeditions we're using challenge courses we're using props and tools like ropes and throwable objects and it's it's there's more gaming and initiative to it mm -hmm. that's probably what would be described as adventure therapy mm -hmm. take the word adventure out slide the word wilderness in which right. is a, Another one. a contested word it has connotations of domination over nature or um, uninhabited places which you know, there's some colonial Christian romantic notions to that word, but we still use it wilderness as to uh, identify places that people don't go very often. They're less inhabited. They're more remote from cities and towns. Those wilderness locations tend to require more than one day to travel into. So overnight or multiple day, multiple week, expeditions doing some type of therapeutic approach would be wilderness therapy mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then there's a whole host of others you just put the word you know in front whether it's people that work with animals so animal assisted therapy equine therapy i've got colleagues that are surf therapists there's some wow. that do climbing so i mean you can interchange all these words the the main ones for me are um, adventure therapy which is activity based um, and nature-based therapy which which is this location-based practice, which can be just nearby nature, which is the easiest place for us to get people excited about this work. Mm -hmm. If they're in an office space, but there's a park across the street, if they're in a hospital or an institutional setting, but there's a, 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 a patch of grass or some forest or something nearby the location, taking it outside would be nature-based. You don't have to be doing adventurous activities. You don't need backpacks and stoves and food for a week. Mm -hmm. It's not wilderness therapy. Is it ecotherapy? Probably. So that's where those two definitions kind of get mixed in. Right. But not all nature-based therapists that are working outdoors are practicing ecotherapy, which is really looking at the eco-psychological principles of human and environmental health. Okay. Wow. This is very. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll stop there because I think I just blurted out a lot. Yeah, of but it's a great. Actually, I've never heard such a good explanation, uh, because it's very it's very easily mixed uh, those terms one with yes. another, and so um, is so is nature based therapy from your experience for everyone. No. Or are there? Yeah. No. No, no, no one therapy is for everyone. Mm -hmm. No one therapy works for any po particular population specifically or more, more successfully than others. I think it's a question of fit. And that only comes through good client assessment and understanding what their needs and preferences are. And for the nature-based aspect of it, one area that we've been working on, and I'm, I'm still working with colleagues to formulate how we think about this, but like, what is our ability to assess someone's, uh, what we call it ecological identity. Mm -hmm. Like how does someone already have a relationship with nature? What does that relationship look like? And to quickly and easily get past this mm -hmm. false understanding that there's a dichotomy between humans and nature, 
we recognize that we're all nature, we're all a part of it, we're all built of the same elements. Um, but what is their relationship to spending time in natural environments is a better way of saying it. Mm -hmm. And if someone, say, grew up in a family or with, you know, with guardians that love doing things outdoors, they went on camping trips, they spent time hiking on the weekends, they went to the mountains, they had a big garden, they had a, a yard that was forested, they had lots of house plants, they kept pets, they kept chickens, you know. If someone already has a strong relationship with the natural world, then it's quite likely that they're going to be open to a therapeutic experience in the mm -hmm. outdoors. Mm -hmm. If someone grew up in Barcelona <laughs> on the 40th floor of an apartment building downtown and didn't have the, the the privilege or the economics in their family to be able to travel and to go places and even even to get out of the city and get into larger wild areas or natural spaces and they may not even have a relationship with the parks that are in the city their experience of an outdoor nature-based ecotherapy experience might be very different mm -hmm. and you might start very slowly and intentionally with ideas about spending time in nature or just objects from nature mm -hmm. most of us as outdoor nature-based practitioners tend to have a lot of objects sitting around in their offices from shells to bones to sticks and twigs and feathers and things that we've we've found really interesting or clients have found really interesting and we've just kind of hung on to them but we actually use them as part of our therapeutic process mm -hmm. I have a basket um, It's in my office in the city right now, but I have a basket with just objects and I might ask a client, you know, is there anything in that basket that is of interest to you? Is there anything that, that, you know, is intriguing or calls out to you mm -hmm. and however you want to frame it relative to their needs. And they might pull an item out and say, I find this really interesting. I have no idea what it is. Mm -hmm well, that's actually a deer antler or that's a feather from a red tail hawk or that's a, and so then there's a place for a conversation about something natural. And it's almost like a vicarious experience of nature as opposed to a direct experience of nature. Mm -hmm. And so we look at this in our nature-based therapy book, we put together a bit of an assessment model, mm -hmm. which looks at indirect Mm -hmm. experiences with nature direct experiences with nature but then even like a vicarious experience of nature which could be you you, you can see behind me there's pictures on the wall one is of a mountaineering trip one is of a um, a painting of a canoe or paddling in some fog on a lake those are vicarious nature experiences mm -hmm. you're not there i'm not there that's not even a real picture that's a painting right. but we can have a lived experience of what that might be like. We can think about where the person is. It looks like it might actually be cold, but it's foggy. It could be in the summer, the sun's breaking through the clouds. Like that's the vicarious experience of nature. And, and for us, that's a powerful experience because it gets someone to think about and think about how they feel mm -hmm. considering themselves in that experience. That could be a first step towards the next session. We're going to actually go to a place like that where there's some trees along a lake and we're going to have our session there mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in between there somewhere is this indirect contact with nature which sometimes can be manufactured so if you're in a city or in any town where there's a park mm -hmm. that is probably a manufactured natural space mm -hmm. they probably took out the natural forest or the natural landscape and they put in pathways and benches and they planted trees and shrubbery. Mm -hmm. And maybe there's flowers and plants and greenery that isn't natural or, or indigenous to that area, but it looks really beautiful. Mm -hmm. This is what parks people do, right? They make beautiful spaces for people to hang out in. Yeah. And there's some evolutionary understanding of that in terms of human psychology, in terms of um, long standing preferences for places that have flat grassy areas mm -hmm. some trees big trees with low big hang low hanging branches mm -hmm. those are easy psychologically easy escape routes if there's predators in the area right like, visibility think, yeah and the mobility you can see well so these are safe preferential outdoor environments that's very different taking a client into that space 
than walking towards a trail that is into a deep dark forest where you can see the entrance but it looks like the entrance to a cave yeah you can imagine that someone has a completely different psychological experience mm -hmm. walking into that space versus walking into the open park mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and these are the types of things that we want our you know the practitioners who take up uh, an ecotherapy or a nature-based therapy practice to think about like you are providing a service for someone who has come to you for help if you understand what their needs are what their preferences are and for us that's like what is their ecological identity you'll be better be able to design and implement a session in an environment that is is <clears throat> more aligned with where their needs are right you know uh, a 10 or 12 year old in an after school session who's been sitting all day who has so much energy it may be best to conduct the session 15 minutes up that steep hill over there and the grind of getting up there that physicality may be a great grounding exercise deal with a considerable amount of pent-up energy and potentially frustration if they're not having success in that school environment and then an opportunity to sit and also have an expansive view and perspective, a different perspective, right? The metaphorical quality of that is probably 50% of the session, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which also is something that counselors and therapists and practitioners need to get accustomed to is it's not all about you for the session. <clears throat> not that anybody should be thinking it's about them, but we constantly think like, how is what I'm saying, what I'm doing therapeutic and helping this person within the time that we're spending together? Mm -hmm. And a nature-based therapist has to be accepting of the fact that sometimes it's the movement into, through, and within the space that is the power and value of the session, as opposed to what we end up coming up with when mm -hmm. we prefer, you know, we we prefer or give preference to thoughts and verbalization of those thoughts mm -hmm. that's i mean if you're a psychotherapist you know that a, a, the training suggests that that is the power of the session whereas in nature-based therapy we have to accept that the experience in the environment may be more powerful than giving preference to what we can come up with in our minds and verbalize back and forth to each other right it's a very somatic it's 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 mm -hmm. given that it's a somatic approach it's it's quite similar to some of the somatic experiencing training that i've i've taken part in where how a person responds to the distance maybe that we walk the intensity mm -hmm. or pace with which we walk mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. a very minor um example there is if we're entering into a difficult conversation with a client and the pace of their walking is demonstrating that they're uncomfortable with the conversation, they may be walking faster than usual. Yeah. And so I actually slow my pace just, just slower so that the client feels like they're pulling ahead on the trail and they slow down and match my pace. And then I might slow down a little bit more until we're at a walking speed that actually matches the intensity of the conversation. Like if there's a, a hard statement that's coming forth it doesn't match with like this fast walking pace mm -hmm. and i know that some sessions are better off seated seating um and and being quiet and calm in the body but sometimes we can't get to those same conversations unless there's movement sometimes it's not the movement sometimes it's the fact that we're both facing the same direction and we're not facing each other mm -hmm. There's no eye contact because we have to have our eyes on the trail so that we know where we're going. Mm -hmm. And when your eyes are on the trail, your eyes are moving back and forth and they're scanning for roots and rocks and the next step up because there's a bit of an incline. Mm -hmm. And your eyes then start to be <laughs> doing something that got patterned into a practice called EMDR. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, you know, I have a friend in Australia, a colleague who's been talking about this and the conversations we've had it's like well that kind of sounds like tracking when you're on trail yeah right so there's there's a lot going on 
in an outdoor experience that we don't actually know and we're not actually very sophisticated in talking about it and it feels like every time we have these conversations we're sticking our neck out saying something that may or may not be evidenced in the future right Mm -hmm. there's pretty good indication that the intensity the type of activity the choice of location are we sitting a on a a rock overlooking Mm -hmm. a big view where there's a big open vista are we down on a beach sitting on a log or just right on the sand and there's waves crashing in front of us i mean there's so much going on in such a dynamic environment you would think there was almost too much stimuli for a counseling session right this is what i was thinking if it's if it's not distracting uh sometimes on one hand i was thinking that you know, those experiences might actually help to build a stronger relationship, therapeutic relationship, because you feel this person more physically. Uh, mm-hmm. um, at least this is what I'm in- intuitively. Yeah, there's a shared physical, right. emotional, cognitive experience. Your relationship building is not just an exchange of words mm-hmm. or being present. And I know there's so much more to it than words in a counseling session in an office. I know that there's a way mm-hmm. to show that you're attending to needs and that there's there is a relationship developing that has so many aspects to it but a shared experience in nature has nature as co-therapist as well so there's Mm -hmm. there's a triad there right right? client counselor Mm -hmm. i don't think an office space contributes as much to that experience as an outdoor environment especially one that the client chooses Mm -hmm. as preferential Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. client says I really like locally we have there's a there's a park that has a beautiful waterfall that's you just have to walk under a highway to get up a little creek bed to get to and you get to sit at the base of a very significant you know little body of water smashing against the rocks well only in the last few years have we learned that the water smashing against those rocks is producing um, one of the highest levels of negative ions Mm -hmm. in terms of particles in the ionosphere Mm -hmm. and it actually creates a sense of well-being like being near it it feels powerful you feel the energy of it Mm -hmm. well there is actually ionization which means there is actual energy there that as humans we are physically and visually feeling so we're having that experience so Mm -hmm. if a person says i feel really well there and they want to have their counseling session there then why wouldn't you take them there do you know yeah. what I mean? Exactly. It almost would yeah. seem, and this is, I'm, I'm being completely tongue in cheek here, but it would almost seem unethical for me then to say, no, we're going to meet in my office. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's so eye opening, uh, still so new uh, mm-hmm. to me, but uh, going I... back, yeah, go, going back to, 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 to my previous question, um, I was thinking that it's not, necessarily distractful but it has Mm. this co-therapeutic aspect right it's not necessarily distracting it's co-healing and like yes uh, and i i i I tagged the word distraction in my mind and wanted to go back to it as well that's what i was um Mm. beginning to sorry interrupt you about but distraction is this idea that it's taking something away from us Mm -hmm. and what we've seen both in research and I've done this in a anecdotal way in my classroom for years is that I've tested this concept of attention restoration theory. There's another stress reduction theory is similar, but attention restoration theory is this idea that when we're in an environment that is um, either challenging cognitively or physically, that, that there's something that's taking away from our ability to focus and pay attention on whatever it is we're trying to do Mm -hmm. in a classroom as an educator in a classroom that is essentially a box and one of the classes i'm teaching in this fall doesn't even have a window it Mm -hmm. is terrible space for me to be in but or and my students in that box there's a person at the front providing a lecture and I'm using slides and I'm trying to be as entertaining and as, as engaging as possible. But basically after 20 minutes, it's just like, wah, 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 wah. Students have lost their ability to focus. That building, that space that I'm in is constructed of straight lines. Mm -hmm. There's almost 
there's there's nothing moving besides me. It's a stagnant environment. And you would think there's hardly any distractions in there. Mm -hmm. If I took and gave that same lecture to those same students in an outdoor environment, and there's a forest behind me, and there's birds chirping in the trees, and there's squirrels running on the branches, and we're hearing all sorts of other natural nature sounds. There's 10,000 times um, stimuli there. Mm -hmm. there's, there's so much going on. It's mm -hmm. such a dynamic, diverse environment. And yet what we've found and seen in research is that because it's a natural environment, it's one that humans grew up in evolutionarily mm -hmm. that is natural mm -hmm. that is a state that is okay for humans to be okay in without taxing their directed attention and so what happens is in an environment like that your capacity to focus actually increases right even though there's so much more stimuli and mm -hmm. that's something that i was i was using a i would give this absolutely horrible lecture on environmental degradation like the world's burning up and, you know, fossil fuels. And blah, blah. I would do that for 15 minutes and I would give my students a test where they had to, you know, put their pencil down. I would give them uh, a series of five numbers and they'd, they'd have to pick up their pencil and remember them, write them down. Six numbers, same thing. Seven numbers, same things. Eight, nine. And then they would fold that paper up and give it to me. And then we'd go outside. I worked on a campus that had a, a nice natural area. We could hike up a hill away from the campus, go into a forest where all the rocks were covered with moss. And it was a nice little, um, mm -hmm. almost like a little amphitheater of trees. Mm -hmm. I would do like a one minute grounding exercise, some mindful meditation. And then I'd ask them to get their pencils and paper out again. And I would give them five numbers They'd pick up their pencils, they'd write the numbers down, six numbers, same thing, seven numbers, eight numbers, nine numbers. And then we'd take a 15 minute break. I'd leave them in the woods. I'd go back into the classroom. I'd do a quick calculation. I would present them with the results when they came back into class. And almost consistently, there was a 20 to 25% increase wow. in their memory. Wow. And that to me, I, mean, I should have been, I should have been doing it for an actual paper. I should have actually gotten research ethics and done it that way, but I was just doing it in the classroom yeah. to prove a point to myself. Does, oh. a, does, is there such a thing as attention restoration theory or not? Um, mm -hmm. And then I taught the concept after that, of course, so I didn't prime them with that. But I think there's something to that, that yeah. Yeah. we need to spend more time, obviously, in a natural environment. Mm -hmm that our, our human bodies were evolutionarily designed mm -hmm. for. The part that's harder to convince people of is the physical activity side of it. Mm -hmm. our, our bodies were designed as hunter gatherers to probably, I think that someone did a study and said the equivalent would be to walk at least a half marathon a day, mm -hmm. it's 22 kilometers. Mm -hmm. The human nice. body, is designed to walk 22 kilometers a day. Now, if you ask someone, I need you to walk 22 kilometers a day, they're going to call you crazy and think that that's absolutely ridiculous. Now we've got so many people that are wearing yeah. Fitbits and measure and steps. <laughs> they're taking their biometrics and they're measuring steps. And I'm trying to get 10,000 steps today. And so I think there's something to that part of it that's maybe hard for funders and insurance companies to get their heads around. It's like, uh, are you doing therapy? Are you just out doing nature walks? Mm -hmm. Which brings me back to your first question around definitions. We also have this practice that you and I are both engaged in the learning process around, which is forest bathing or forest therapy. Mm -hmm. And that there's a particular model that's being taught there mm -hmm. that may or may not be the same as what we're talking about when we say ecotherapy and nature therapy. Forest bathing, of course, grew out of um, Japan. And then there's mm -hmm. quite a practice in Korea. Um, Shinrin Yoku, I think, is the mm -hmm. Japanese name for it. And I'll, I'll probably not get it right. But I think it's Samlinyok, which is the Korean. I think I got that wrong. But I've read it in a book that I helped edit. <laughs> um, now, those practices were culturally embedded in terms of their local relationships to forests. In Japan, of course, there was a, a religious connotation mm -hmm. there with um bon and shinto religions that were closely tied to mm -hmm. nature-based earth 
earth informed mm-hmm. religion mm-hmm. trees you know are part of the you know the idol tree of mm-hmm. spirituality and so forth and it it is has been translated and turned into training programs there's a number of them in europe there's a number of them in north america and different places so people are training as forest therapy guides or forest right. bathing guides yeah. Yeah. it's not therapy i mean the forest bathing practice is a health promotion practice mm-hmm. that's based on sensory awareness activities doing mindfulness meditate not meditation necessarily but mindful activities in nature mm-hmm. focusing on the five senses and i think that it is amazing that it has caught on that so many people are practicing that it's getting people out and connected with nature it's great it's great it's great the title when people use forest therapy i think is something they have to do with caution and i think they're trained to be cautious with mm-hmm. the language of it mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because folks might be coming to them seeking therapy yeah not going to get it yeah. but hopefully they can be referred on to or that the forest bathing practice it's, itself can assist them in resolving and ameliorating some of the problems or mm-hmm. issues they might be having. Mm-hmm. Health promotion in general tends to take care of a lot of mm. the early stages and parts of mental health that maybe are getting in the way of someone's full quality of life. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. The second part of that, when they start saying forest therapy, they're starting to suggest now, and some of the training programs are, saying if you are already a practitioner of therapy you're the social worker counselor occupational therapists are taking this up quite readily people that work in the schools as um, behavioral needs or educational assistants Mm -hmm. are taking this up they're starting to actually use forest bathing in a way that is allowing them to do therapeutic work right and there's a huge risk about it right and it's great to be to be talked about yes absolutely mm-hmm. so i had a couple of more so i wanted to ask you and evan how did you start doing it this is uh, you know what many people ask me as well yeah it's and i think if i've said this a number of times so it's out there in the public domain but i i grew up in a really really small isolated mm-hmm. in industry town so basically in the oil industry in, in Northern Canada, a town of 500 people, which were primarily people that worked in the oil industry, uh, a small school of like less than 100 students that, you know, only went up to, I think, grade nine or 10. And then you had to ship kids out for high school to a different town. And there was only one other settlement close by that was, you know, maybe 50 kilometers away. It was a first nations uh, settlement. And then from there, it was probably another 200 kilometers to the next town or settlement that might've had a couple thousand people in it, maybe 2000 people in it, but it was basically at the end of a road. So we had wolf, bear, uh, you know, moose, even the Southern ranges of the, the muskox or like the the arctic bison that that travel in the north of canada that's where i lived and grew up and so i thought that's how every canadian grew up i thought that was the environment that everybody knew about um like how to how to locate direction based on where the moss is on a tree you know <laughs> like and and how to you know use a knife and start fires and camp and fish and be outdoors and hunt and so when I when I first went to college I was asked by some people that I lived with to go to the mountains uh on the weekend and I said yeah sure sounds like fun what are we doing oh we're just going backpacking I'm like yeah what are we what are we doing Mm -hmm. we're going backpacking and I'm like well what are we going to the mountains for like are we are we fishing are we hunting like to me there always was some purpose to go out that you would be extracting some resources that you needed to come Mm -hmm. back to the settlement Mm -hmm. and in retrospect it sounds really ridiculous and very simple-minded but i i was shocked that they were just going to the mountains to go to the mountains right we basically backpacked into a lake and sat around and looked at the mountains and then came home at the end of the weekend and my mind was blown by this. Well, first of all, I had to make 
some interventions to keep people safe. Mm -hmm. So I realized that I'm, I've got some skills here. I've got some knowledge that others don't have. And by the time I finished university a couple years later, I was guiding. Mm -hmm. So in my third year of college university, I actually started leading people outdoors. Mm -hmm. So that became what I did off and on through different jobs at different times. But I was always kind of in and around outdoor recreation and um, adventure. Mm -hmm. recreation. So doing things with more risk, mm -hmm. climbing, whitewater paddling, uh, rafting, caving, long backpacking trips, um, you know, going to South America, climbing, you know, big volcanoes, just having these experiences myself, but then always trying to find work mm -hmm. that was related to that. So I could be outdoors. I could be with people leading groups. Um, and then I eventually ended up working in a residential treatment center for youth that were in care of the government. Some were, you know, street affected. They'd been homeless. Some were involved in gangs, some had long histories of abusive families and relationships. Some had substance abuse issues. Um, some it was like learning disabilities, failure within the school system that led to behavioral issues. Mm -hmm. Primarily just a bunch of wonderful young people that were living communally in the care of the government. And we were running outdoor programs for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that just went from there to another job doing the same thing interspersed with my own travels and adventures. And so probably since my mid twenties, so for 25 years now, I've been around individuals and organizations that work with individuals or groups or families outdoors doing either educational, developmental, or therapeutic mm -hmm. program. Mm -hmm. it, I can make jokes about having limited transferable job skills. <laughs> I, really, I don't really know what else I would do. Um, I've I've looked at changing careers and doing other things, but very little of it is of interest. And so mm -hmm. it just happened to be that when I tried to get out of the field, I was doing a master's degree in organizational leadership mm -hmm. and was really keen on behavioral change. Mm -hmm. and how to, how to shift people's thinking or to shift the the ethos or um sort of character within organizations within mm -hmm. groups that had culture and history that sometimes was good and sometimes bad and then I got recruited to do a PhD and ended up studying adolescent wilderness therapy in the United States and have since been involved in sort of the academic side of it and so doing right. research looking at programs from the perspective of outcomes but also the mechanisms of change like how does this work mm -hmm. and that's where we started writing and saying well we've been doing this long enough we've kind of got some ideas mm -hmm. some implicit theory that isn't expressed but mm, let's maybe try to put it on paper and see if we can actually figure out what's happening here and so um, beyond that I work with organizations as a consultant I have a small private practice as a nature-based counselor and um mm -hmm. I, yeah and here we are yeah <laughs> so it came very came very naturally for you in the end right yeah and i can say that comfortably in retrospect like mm -hmm. when i look back and say oh this all makes sense it all ties together now mm -hmm. but it didn't necessarily make sense at the time nor did i know where i was going to end up Mm -hmm. There was never a plan to mm -hmm. work mm -hmm. in a university. I actually mm -hmm. have, don't tell my employers this, but my, <laughs> my value structure around like university education as it is right now is not actually very high. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think the system itself is actually fairly redundant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anything that I say to my students, unless it's a personal story or anecdote, they can probably find online quicker than I could. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So really, it's about the relationship of, mm -hmm. of student and teacher that allows for improvements to the mm -hmm. educational process. Mm -hmm. But the system itself, textbooks, mm -hmm. lecturing, mm -hmm. an hour and a half blocks twice a week, like to me, that's all systematized routine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's not necessarily conducive to really good learning or, or mm -hmm. growth. And so mm -hmm. 
I try to make change within the institutions. And if not, if I can't, then within my own Practice. capacity as it, in my classroom, in the experiences. So I teach outdoor recreation. I teach leadership courses. Um, up until this last Christmas, I was teaching um, uh, group work, group counseling, mm -hmm. and also supervising students in practice, which I really love doing because that's where you bring that educational piece into practice. And mm -hmm. you get to see, hear, uh, and feel and sense what the student is actually going through and whether or not the learning in the institution is actually of any value to them. Mm -hmm. Because if they're not able to extract from that and put into practice, then why are we spending time doing it? I'll provide, but but currently I do provide consulting. Mm -hmm. And that consulting has often been around um, organizations and private practitioners that want to make the transition to nature-based therapy. Wow, okay. Or outdoor or ecotherapy, however they want to define it. And that that takes me back through all of my experiences from designing and developing programs, the management and administration of those programs, um, assessing and, and mitigating risk within those programs, uh, curriculum design for programs, mm -hmm. and also helping people philosophically identify what it is they actually really want to do. Right. Well, some people in my field of adventure therapy have actually moved completely away from the use of that word altogether. I mean, they're like, yeah, I actually don't, I don't do adventure. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't use the risk challenge paradigm in my work. And so I'm not actually going to use it in my, my promotional material for my organization. And I feel, of course, yeah. you know, that we started this conversation with definitions and I think it's one that's really important as a consultant to get people to start with like what is it that you actually want to do call your practice what it actually is yeah like, if you are a brief solution focused trained therapist that is what you do if you happen to practice it outdoors you might you know slide in the so brief solution focused <laughs> nature-based therapist or yeah one who practices outdoors yeah right? yeah yeah so i mean it's really important to call to name what it is that you do mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and then build on the practice and primarily i, I think it's important for people if you're trained as a, a, a clinical social worker to not then just adopt a term like oh i'm an adventure therapist Unless that's what you're actually doing all the time. And really, are you or are you just being a clinical social worker who uses some adventure based activities? Right. And, and be really clear about what you do, because then you can set your own boundaries and not go outside of them. And I think one of the areas that we're still talking about here in Canada, and we actually should be talking about more is insurance. Right. Mm -hmm. And as a clinical counselor registered in this province that I live in it's pretty clear there's a checkbox for adventure therapy that I don't check because I'm not practicing adventure therapy my insurance covers me doing what any traditional clinical counselor in the province would be doing and it can include walk and talk mm -hmm. but that walk and talk probably means on designated set maintained trails and spaces so we use parks we use local beaches you know there's some areas where there's trail systems already set and designated my association would not be happy to hear if i was then dragging clients you know off on back roads up into wildlands that didn't have designated trails and facilities and so forth because then i would be doing something outside of what they consider walk and talk mm -hmm. Now, even as I'm saying this out loud, I know that that conversation hasn't really been clarified. And I think it's time for us to actually, as practitioners, have that conversation and say, mm -hmm. how do we approach the association and say, we're going to set the parameters for this so that you can back them up. Yeah. Because otherwise, something's going to happen and then they will dictate to us and say something as simple as, no more out of office practice. Yeah, yeah, it's a huge responsibility. Yeah, and that would be a tragedy. Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, there there are many programs and um, and trainings how to become an ecotherapist, but but not so many actually, no. and of different qualities. So it's this experience that you have uh, is so precious, right? And uh, thank you so much for sharing it, mm -hmm. uh, for taking time and and talking about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um thank you for the comment but i i also don't feel that it's that precious again because it's just what i've been doing for a long mm -hmm. time and i don't see it as something that has to be seen or understood as being very complex mm -hmm. i think for those who have moved into say training with forest bathing i just had a, a group of 26 students on tuesday just a few days ago we were we were out in a park forced bathing and when I you know when I see 26 students who have been invited to walk around the park and identify um textures just to observe think about textures that's it that's all they were invited to do these are 20 to 25 year olds Many of them in the in the the programs that I teach in are are becoming exercise physiologists or mm -hmm. phys physical education teachers in the school system. Some might work in public parks and recreation. At that age, I would not have been able to stay focused and take an activity like that very seriously. To me, it would have seemed weird hippie strange. <laughs> but at the exact same time and this is a thought in retrospect if someone had said see if you can I spend 15 minutes in the woods still and see if you can identify movement because i have a hunting and fishing background that would make sense to me mm -hmm. and those are skills that we can develop mm -hmm. and we had them evolutionarily and so I would be really into that. Mm. But the way that this was framed was like, go look at texture or go, you know, identify five natural and five unnatural sounds and then come back and talk about it. These students were so engaged. Right. And they were saying mm -hmm. things like, I feel so good right now. I feel so relaxed. Mm. And I need to take more time to just lay in the grass and listen to the bird song. And so, you know, people that are getting involved in forest therapy, forest bathing, they are going to have a significant impact on a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I think that could be potentially, if we build relationships with the forest therapy people well, that could be a gateway to build clientele for outdoor therapies. Right. They mm -hmm. may be that they don't. There's stigma, they don't feel they're necessarily in need of therapy, but they're kind of sub threshold mm -hmm. symptoms. Mm -hmm. What's this forest bathing about? I'll go have this experience. They have this experience in nature and they're like, whoa, this feels really good. And then the idea of therapy mm -hmm. is more approachable if they see that someone provides outdoor or nature based or eco therapy. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it could be that they're really opening up the door for a lot of people to, to move into the practice. And plus post COVID, the number of practitioners who said, I work in an office, I work in an office, I work, how can I get this training? So I don't have to work in my office. <laughs> there was a, a clear switch that was flipped mm -hmm. because at least here, the protocols that were put in place were just so outrageous in terms of having to, clean everything and you know anything touched and spacing and distance and we were only we only halted practice for a couple of weeks and then we simply wrote some policies and said clients can do their own health checks we can maintain distance outdoors there's no need for masks there's no need for distance or there, no there's no need for um cleaning anything it just we just continued doing nature-based therapy mm -hmm. through the entire pandemic, mm -hmm. right? Wow. So, yeah. I think at that point there were there were other practitioners in different you know areas, whether counselors, psychologists, whatever, that started signing up for the trainings and saying, "Yeah, I, I got to figure this out because it's out of out of need." 
-hmm. Now, whether they've gone back into their offices or not, I don't know. That would be yeah. interesting to follow up on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I did, I did those things myself as well. When I could not really meet my clients in person, I would do online or on the phone sessions, but from the forest. And it oh, really yeah. made so much difference. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that's a, again, I, I accept technology. I get things are moving forward and there's always going to be advances and that the next generation is going to be more open to it and so forth. That is a great step from office-based to having both practitioner and, count, and, and client out in nature, but on their cell phones. And if they're actually sharing and paying attention to what's around them and that's a part of the conversation i think that's great i think it's a step up from telehealth or online mm -hmm. therapy um but yeah i i just don't i can't see myself practicing in that way right there's still a missing element a very yeah. important one mm. yeah yeah and a big part of that is is actually just the human to human relationship mm -hmm. and the fact we're in relationship we're in conversation there's an energy exchange there's i mean i think that's just absolutely critical and the somatic experience right like shared yeah. physical experience mm. yeah and and because you have climbed the hill together or walked across the stream and got your feet wet together it truly is an authentic shared experience mm-hmm Mm -hmm. um, I've had a couple clients, actually only two male clients that were game for this, but we we also did cold water immersion. Yes, I did it, do it too. Yeah. Me being a, maybe a little, little bit overly cautious, um, we had a session. We worked on um, some ideas and intentions around what that might be like when we did the cold water immersion. And then I officially ended the session and then we went into the water. Mm. <laughs> I, I, I even told the clients, I'm like, I, I just don't feel like I can do this as a practitioner because this would step across that line potentially into what would be called adventure therapy mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I'm entering into a different physical environment that is going to have a very different effect on the human, on the body and I don't necessarily want that to be a part of the session. I would say I, I probably wouldn't have any issues with it if it came up and they had a negative experience. And if they were reporting me, like they were game for it. Like it was something that we agreed on. I didn't ask them to do anything I wasn't going to do myself. But to end the session, trying to do like a two to three minute cold water submersion, I think it may have been late in the year too like maybe pushing to december like maybe late november wow and we were in the ocean wow so it was old like it was a really good cold water immersion mm. and uh and it was really appreciated you know wow. it was really appreciated so yeah. there's there's so much potential here that yeah. we just don't really understand yet mm -hmm. that um excites me and as a researcher yeah. it excites me yeah Wow, thank you for, for, for all of this, Nevin. Super, super interesting. Um, yeah, looking forward to talking uh, about this um, next time, for sure. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Well, thank you for the opportunity. I appreciated it. And um, again, I think I appreciate it. <laughs>